This is the Erasing Shame Podcast and your host, DJ Chuang. It is amazing how difficult it is to find a location to record a podcast outside of a closet where the acoustics are much better controlled. I'm sitting B-side here in Coronado Island at just outside of San Diego. And on this episode, I'm on the go. So I'm sharing with you a recording that comes from October of 2022 in a conversation with Curtis Chang and David French, who recorded a podcast live before a audience in the Washington DC area about his new book that just released last week on May 16th, 2023. And the title is The Anxiety Opportunity. It comes with a great course, online course, very affordable. I'm in the middle of the course because I'm digesting it slowly. It really gives some very valuable and practical tools on dealing with anxiety, not as something to overcome, but something we go through as a path and a doorway for spiritual growth, the full title of the book, The Anxiety Opportunity, How Worry is the Gateway to Your Best Self. So highly recommend the book and the online course. The course is designed for an individual to go through or with a small group, seven weeks, online course. Excellent, excellent book. Excellent course as well. So anxiety isn't something to get rid of. It's something that you can go through. And he, the Curtis, makes a good case for how even Jesus dealt with anxiety. Case in point was his moments anticipating the cross at the garden of Gethsemane so if Jesus could be anxious it's okay for us to be anxious too so listen to this great conversation with Curtis Chang and David French David French makes the introduction and I'll see you on the other side Uh, this podcast is we're going to be talking about a book that Curtis has written and is coming out but not coming out imminently, we're just like getting ready for it to come out, about anxiety. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically interview Curtis today, and we're going to talk about anxiety, um, and talk about anxiety not just from the standpoint of this sort of highly personal phenomenon, but how anxiety is radiating out from us as individuals and impacting the world around us in incredibly tangible ways. So Let's just get started. So, Curtis, why did you write a book on anxiety? Well, I wrote it because I'm not a mental health expert, and professionally speaking, I don't have a degree in mental health, but I have a lifelong experience with anxiety. (laughs) So, looking back, uh, growing up, I would be what many psychologists call somebody that had highly functional anxiety. So, a highly functional anxious person is somebody who has learned to deal with their anxiety by channeling it into all sorts of practices like staying on top of things, making constant contingency plans and scanning. And so that, you know, the very nice bio that was read uh, before we started this podcast, I attribute a lot of that to anxiety. That, <laughs> that I was just, anxiety is a great motivator for uh, being productive in, in a certain way. Um, but if you have undealt with, un, un sort of uh, treated anxiety, Uh, highly functional anxiety can only get you so far. And for many people, they will reach a breaking point where those coping mechanisms no longer uh, function well. And that happened for me in my late 30s. Um, I'm actually much older than that. I I know I don't look it. Um, I have the the Asians don't raisin thing going on. (laughs) So uh, people always think I'm younger than I actually am. I'm actually about, actually 50, 53. Um, But in my late 30s, I was a senior pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California, and the church was going through a lot of challenges, a lot of stresses. This was all during uh, the dot-com bust, which hit Silicon Valley, so our church, and I was replacing the founding pastor, which uh, is never an easy task uh, to do. And uh, basically, all of my mechanisms for being a highly functional anxious person just broke down, and I was overwhelmed. I went through a three-week period where I did not sleep at all. I mean, I must have slept 
in terms of micro sleep because a human body can't function that way. But my anxiety was so high that I don't remember consciously falling asleep for three weeks straight. And that, of course, leads to just all sorts of an utter breakdown. Um, I, I, I do had a breakdown. I went on disability um, for, I was on disability for nine months, uh, and it essentially ended my, my pastoral career. So I've never uh, been a pastor since then. I've done, done a number of other things uh, that have led me to here, which is a whole other story, but it, it was catastrophic um, and on a, on a variety of fronts in terms of my relationships, certainly my career, my spiritual life. Uh, you don't go through something like that without a sort of some very dark night of the soul. So I know anxiety firsthand, uh, and I know the treatments for anxiety. I've taken medication uh, over the years. I'm not currently on it, but I have been in the past. Uh, I've been years of therapy, uh, all sorts of therapy, cognitive behavioral uh, treatment, uh, a number of other uh, kinds of uh, therapy. Uh, and I have a ton of friends who are in the mental health professions as psychiatrists, researchers, therapists themselves. I'm fascinated with the, the, the profession of mental health. And I've read a ton, and I've reflected deeply on, because you don't go through a devastating experience like that and not reflect, what was that? What, is, what was the meaning of that? How do I think about what I went through spiritually, especially? And as I've reflected on my own experience, on the, on the way in which anxiety is, is responded to in the church and in our wider culture, and then especially responded theologically and biblically on how, how as Christians ought we understand this experience called anxiety, I became convinced that in, in some fundamental ways, speaking as a generalization, but in some fundamental ways, uh, we as a church are quite mistaken. We are quite misguided in how we are treating and responding to anxiety. And that's not only having some really significant uh, dysfunction for individuals, but it is causing dysfunctions in how the church collectively exists in the world and how it relates to the wider world. And that's really uh, the topic I think we're talking about today. But this is why I wrote the book, was I just felt like, like we need to re fundamentally rethink how we are approaching anxiety. Yeah, so when I, I, I hear you talking about this, you know, I didn't realize how much the pastor to podcaster pipeline was paved with anxiety. Yeah, exactly. But the, you know, there's, um, this is a situation where your story is not a, an outlier story in the way that people interact with anxiety. I mean, yeah. there, um, this is a, this is a, your story is in many ways an our story. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's very sort of effective when people are trying to figure out how, how big a problem is something is you kind of have to marry the personal story to the data. Yeah. So here's the data, and then here's what it looks like in an individual life, and we went kind of in the reverse. So that was what it looked like in your life, but what's the data? How big a deal is this? Is this something that's really a social problem, or is this more like Tobias Funke and Arrested Development in the small band of never nudes, <laughs> where there are just dozens, dozens of people with that problem? Um, no, is this something that is a, a big deal right now? Well, I'll talk about the data in a second, but actually let's survey the audience right now. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you know an adult in your life that is struggling with anxiety? Okay. O almost everybody has, yeah. not completely, but almost 90% uh, you know, of the room has risen. Yeah. Let me ask you, how many of you know a teen, either in your, in your church, in your community, in your life, in your own family, a teen or college stage, well, you know, that is struggling with anxiety, so show of hands. Like, again, almost like 95, almost, almost unanimous. So uh, there we go. There's our scientific data for the day. No, it's, it's your experience in the room, uh, my experience is emblematic of what is happening in our world and in our society. Uh, and we, the statistics show there has been a decades-long rise, gradual rise in anxiety that sharply took a spike during the pandemic. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's shown that there was a 25% rise in one year alone during the pandemic in anxiety rates, and that hasn't gone back down. 
um, or it's only sort of leveled off, such that the NIH, National Institutes of Health's most recent sort of study shows one in four adults, or one in five, I'm sorry, one in five adults are suffering from some significant mental health disorder with anxiety being the leading um, sort of disorder of that, that adult. So that's one in five, that's 20%. That's even significantly worse when it comes to teens uh, and, 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 um, and college students. So one recent study that's a meta study that basically looks at like hundreds of studies and tries to, Calgary, tries to uh, synthesize that from the University of Calgary shows that anxiety in the last few years has doubled in teens, so doubled, um, such that the majority of teens and college students now, the, the, the rates generally go from somewhere from 50 to 60 percent is the general uh, range, so 50 to 60 percent of teens or college students report significant anxiety. So the majority, more, you know, more, you're, the averages will show that the typical teen you meet uh, is going to be probably suffering from anxiety more often than not. And psychology today summarized all of this results this way. They said that when you look at it in aggregate, the average high school kid today has the same level anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Okay, <laughs> so let me repeat that. The average high school kid today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. So that shows you just sort of how bad it is out there. And you have to correspond that with the fact that, talking about this from, from a Christian perspective, that as a church, we are not well prepared to respond to this. In a recent Barna survey, uh, only 30% of Christian pastors uh, reported that they felt well-equipped to deal with mental health issues. Right? That's only 30% for the most pressing, probably the most pressing sort of emotional and spiritual issue that their congregation is facing. Only 30% of pastors felt well-equipped to deal with this issue. And in fact, pastors themselves are more and more looking like me in my early 30s. They themselves are crumbling under all of the pressures of dealing with this and all of the other many, many issues, including the political polarization and toxicity that's affecting our churches. Uh, they're, they're, and it's, it's especially young pastors that are struggling with it. Um, a recent LifeWay survey said that among pastors, uh, pastors under the age of 45, four out of 10 reported a significant meaningful mental health issue in their own lives. So four out of 10, that's 40% of pastors themselves. So you have a wounded shepherd leading a wounded flocks and everybody feeling like, I don't know what to do about this. So, you know, we've been focused on a COVID pandemic the last several years. I think it's important for us to realize we're still in a pandemic. It's a mental health pandemic and there's no vaccine coming to save us from this one. So one, it's always tough to generalize when you're talking about the church because the evangelical church is incredibly diverse. There are all kinds of different approaches to things like anxiety uh, from everything that it's not a, this is just an, a symbol of lack of faith or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, lack of trust in God to folks who are really sort of diving in on the medical side of it. What are the common mistakes that you're seeing um, sort of replicated, it, the, in other words, what are the mistakes that are common enough to really make a difference in how evangelicals are approaching anxiety? So the, the reason why, the book, my, the book of my title is called The Anxiety Opportunity. And the, I chose that title deliberately because how anxiety typically, and again, I'm making generalization, I, I, I'm seeing in my audience some excellent mental health professionals that don't do this, but, and are the exception to the rule. But, but the rule tends to be, uh, if you're going on, on, in the evangelical world, we treat it as solely a problem, a problem to make go away, okay? Not, and so, not as an opportunity, but as a problem to make go away. And it, we make it go away, typically in the evangelical church, in, in one of two ways. So one will say, spiritually, we should be able to have techniques or methods or responses to make this problem go away. So this is the pray anxiety away uh, sort of response, where it treats anxiety even in some circles as a sin, as a sign that you lack faith, right? So you need to have more faith 
uh, and, and often to pray this anxiety away. And so this greatly stigmatizes anxiety because if you confess you have anxiety, you're basically confessing sin, um, and, 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 the, and it's a problem that needs to be, again, eliminated in some way. So that's one stream. Another stream would say, okay, we accept anxiety, but we still, in the sense of, but we don't, we don't say it, call it a sin, but it's still a problem to make go away. It's just that we're going to outsource it to secular mental health to take care of. So we'll, we'll refer you to, you know, some, somebody else, or, we'll, or basically they're saying, we, you know, that's, that's not what we do here in the church. You go see a psychiatrist or a therapist or get counseling. So that's validated to do that, but, but still it plays into the general you know, dominant paradigm, even in secular mental health, that treats anxiety, you know, kind of as a problem, as something to make go away. And this is, and if you read the books that are the best-selling books, so I had to do this when I was, you know, getting my book, uh, pitching my book to publishers, you have to do these comps of like, what are all these other books out there on anxiety? And you, if you do this yourself and you survey the best-selling books on anxiety, you will find that overwhelmingly they use the metaphor, military metaphors in talking about the relationship to anxiety. It's a war, on, war against anxiety, the battle for your mind, right? So like all of these ways in which anxiety is the enemy to be fought and eliminated. And this is the problem is that while I greatly value some of the steps that this approach takes, I mean, I greatly value prayer, of course, um, I value medication and therapy that the secular approaches uh, take. I've benefited from myself. What they are all missing is that they are framing anxiety solely as a problem to eliminate. When I believe in my own experience, but especially in scripture, that anxiety is viewed as a fundamental condition of the human condition, a fundamental aspect of the human condition. It is a human reality. It's not a sin. It's, it's, it's woven into, it's an intrinsic part of what it means to be human. And it is fundamentally an opportunity. It's something that we don't, it's not a problem fundamentally that we make go away. But I don't want to be anxious, Curtis. Yeah, and, and there are many aspects of human being, of human existence that we don't want to have, but is part of what it means to be human. Um, you know, fundamentally, anxiety is really about loss. It's about a feared loss that we have. You know, if you want to think about anxiety, anxiety equals loss. Right, so if you want to know what is the nature of a given anxiety, dive at the underlying loss that is being feared. And here's the news, David, is human beings, we face loss. <laughs> human li life is about encountering loss. So if you're saying you want to eliminate anxiety, you're saying I want to eliminate the prospect and possibility of loss in my life. And that is impossible. <laughs> that is impossible. So you know, anxiety cannot be something we fundamentally view as something we are trying to get a, eliminate. It, it's something that we go through because we go through loss in our life. And so we're going to, if we're going to go through loss, it means we go through anxiety. And the promise, I believe biblically, is on the other side is actually spiritual growth. That spiritual growth is the promise on the other side of anxiety. If we're willing to go through it, and not just make it go away. Reminds me of the Brad Paisley song lyrics. If you're going through hell, keep on moving. Uh, I don't remember the rest of the lyrics. I'm not familiar with that one, David. You're not yeah. familiar? Okay. And I feel like you're not familiar with the never nudes either. So um, <laughs> This is yeah. part of the diversity of, of uh, good faith. Is, is I, I, I have a big gap in my country music <laughs> repertoire. And pop that you culture, fill. country music. There's just a lot. Um, so we're, we've talked a lot about the personal Yep. Right, and and we're going to move more into the corporate. Um, how does anxiety impact the way Christians are engaging in the wider world? And and I'm going to in a minute talk a bit about how this is being weaponized in politics, yep. for example. Um, but in in your view, it, you know, as you're as you're writing the book and you're thinking through anxiety, both as a personal phenomenon and a cultural phenomenon. How is, this, how, how is this impacting the way the church is looking at, interacting with, and participating in the world? Yeah. So I started making the connections between anxiety and the church's impact and stance towards the world when, in the uh, middle of the pandemic, uh, Redeeming Babel led an effort called Christians in the Vaccine. And so this was an effort to try to persuade— Oh, boy, now you've stepped in it. <laughs> persuade— 
Christians, especially evangelical Christians, to take the vaccine because evangelical Christians, especially white evangelicals, were the most vaccine suspicious and fearful population uh, in, in, the, in the world and, and in our country. And it wasn't particularly close. It wasn't even close. That's right. right. It right. wasn't even close, like mm -hmm. by large margin. Mm -hmm. And so I approached this like, okay, well, let's deal with this. Let's try to persuade vaccine fearful evangelicals to take the vaccine. And I thought of this as, okay, let's deal rationally and respectfully with their fears and their concerns. And so what were some of them? Well, so we produced a number of videos that, that I sort of, you know, sort of starred in to try to deal with all of these objections that evangelicals stated was, was the reason for them to be not wanting to take the vaccine. So um, the most popular video that we produced by far uh, was the one on the mark of the beast. Okay, so uh, it was the one that I was sort of most like, oh, do I have to do this? It's like, no, you have to do this. <laughs> and of course, the one that you least like are kind of like wanting to do becomes the most popular <laughs> piece uh, by far. So, so on the mark of the beast, because I had heard and I had picked up and I just, I'd known, I predicted this was going to happen, um, was that there was a segment of evangelical Christians that would view this sort of government's sort of encouraged program as, oh, this is the mark of the beast. So I, in my video, it's a 16-minute video, yet it's still on the Christians of the Vaccine website. You can see it. I do a very rational, I, I hope thoughtful exegesis of Revelation to show why this is not the mark of the beast, even if you read Revelation as a prophecy for the future. And by the way, that's not the right way to read Revelation anyways. Um, but even if you did, like, here's why it just doesn't match up, right? Uh, even on, on your own, own grounds. So it's a very rational sort of like, you know, way to think about it. Uh, the second most popular video we produced was uh, on the, the perceived connections between the vaccine and fetal cells, right? So this is the, there's baby parts mm -hmm. in the vaccine fear. And again, I did a long historical sort of reporting on the historical linkages between the vaccine and fetal cells, making arguments like, look, it's a very distant connection. There are no baby parts in the, in, in the vaccine. If you're taking ibuprofen, it's the same fetal cell that actually, fetal cell line that produced ibuprofen that led to the production of the vaccine. So again, all these sort of rational, factual, biblically, I believe biblically sound arguments. So we had Stanford University uh, did a research study on our, on our videos to show, it's, to, show, to show how effective it was in persuading vaccine hesitant uh, folks. And they did a study, it was with, they used the video that we had with Francis Collins, and showed that our videos were effective by 10%. So we were 10, more 10% 10 more effective than another sort of standard appeal. And they were excited about this, because apparently in public health efforts, if you can produce a 10% increase, like that's a, that's a good you know, intervention. I was really depressed. <laughs> like, really, that's all we got, all that effort, and we got a 10% increase? And that alerted me, like, there's something else going on. <clears throat> there's something else going on. Um, and that has been the pattern with a number of ways in, of ways in which the Christian uh, sort of evangelical circles uh, have gotten caught in dysfunctional relationships with the world. Um, that there's something else other than rational appeals that's going on that, that, that is not being addressed. And so let me just take a quick survey of the room. Um, how many of you know someone in, you know, even cl either close or distant, how many of you know someone that has subscribed to some, what I'm going to argue is a dysfunctional conspiracy theory? Okay, so this could be either vaccine, QAnon, election steal, the election steal. Just show of hands, how many did you know somebody that has gotten caught in a, con okay, again, vast majority of hands go up in the room. How many of you have in some, made some initial effort to try to persuade that person to abandon this dysfunctional conspiracy theory. Just some effort to do so. Okay, okay, keep those hands up, keep those hands up. Okay, how many of you, keep your hands up if this is true, succeeded in that effort? Okay, almost all except one, one hand. One person, we one need to get that person <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> because everybody else <clears throat> has failed. And I would argue that 
the reason why our effort only got this 10% bump and why the vast majority efforts to persuade is because there's something else going on. And that something else is anxiety. That what is driving these conspiracy theories and dysfunctional approaches is not just, you can't fact check people out of this because it is not fundamentally driven by some rational understanding or some factual basis. It is really driven by anxiety. If you look at all of these conspiracy theories, they're soaked in anxiety. They're, they're, they're soaked in anxiety because they're drawing on the latent anxiety that already exists in people and then adding more gasoline to it such that you just throw a match on it and you've got a flaming conspiracy movement. Uh, that, and until we get to that fundamental underpinning, the emotional underpinning that is, that is driving a lot of this dysfunction, we're not getting to the bottom of it. Um, and I'll just say this one last thing as an as illustration for this. Um, I have a friend who has a young uh, daughter who every time that my, this dad would take the daughter to a new social situation, like a new pool, that, a swimming pool they were going to, a new house, or a new store even, uh, this child, which was eight years old, would just have a meltdown, utter meltdown, like physically throw herself onto the ground, writhing, screaming, refuse to go in. And the dad would be, try to be like, look, this is a swimming pool, this is, it's gonna be, it's fine, it's gonna be safe, or this, it's just a store just like any other store. Like try to like rationally persuade this girl that, that she had nothing to fear. Did, just, did not work. And finally, this, this father went to see a, a, a child psychologist, did, did an assessment of the child, and the psychologist said to the dad, like, your, your daughter has social anxiety. Like she has, she has a social anxiety order. And taught him a bunch of sort of responses to rather than just try to talk her out of anxiety, to actually make space and make room for her anxiety, to give her ways to recognize it, to give a name to the anxiety, they, they give a name to the anxiety feeling, how to feel it, how to breathe through it, how to just make space and, and allow for that anxious experience. And that made a huge difference in, in her ability to actually kind of go to into these new situations. And, and I would basically say that I think so many of our Christian thought leaders are like that dad, that we're, we're trying to rationally tell people, this is the right way you ought to think. This is, these are the real facts. This is the biblical truths. And we need to do that. that that's, not a, that's a necessary uh, exercise. I'm not saying we stop doing that. But there isn't something else going on, and we have to make room and space for that anxiety and be able to give new tools to process and, and go through that anxiety, because if we don't, we're going to be like that, that, that child. We're going to be stuck in, in this way because we haven't gotten to the emotional bottom of it. I think there's a lot of resonance there. Now, of course, the entire episode is available at redeemingbabble.com. O R G, and I'll link to the direct episode at erasingshame.com, as well as some of the more recent conversations and interview with the author Curtis Chang. I know oftentimes with authors in a new book, they kind of run around the circuit and talk about the same thing regarding the book. And Curtis certainly is well versed with his book, having talked about the book and his own experience with anxiety uh, on many occasions. So I'll link to a couple of the most recent interviews and conversations and podcasts about the book so you can get a few more samplings of what's happened since that conversation back in October. Again, at the website, erasingshame.com, you'll get the show notes to the book, to the online course, to some of the other interviews, as well as the podcast episode in its entirety and you'll want to watch your video available in the video format this one's just going to be an audio episode to make it convenient for me to upload and keep you abreast on some of the best resources that are coming out this month in the may of 2023 for asian american month as well as mental health month so thank you for listening appreciate your feedback your subscription and your sharing the Eration Shame podcast to your friends, to your neighbors, to others, so that we can continue being about this movement, this 
uh, tribe, this community of erasing shame so that we can all live better lives and become the best version of ourselves. Tune in uh, again next week at erasingshame.com and we'll see you around. Bye-bye.